If you have any connection to the north central region of North America, you have experienced the effects of Lake Agassiz. However, Lake Agassiz is one of our secret lakes that is unknown by most people who are not directly tied to water management in the region. Lake Agassiz is named after the Swiss biologist and geographer Louis Agassiz, or Louis Agassiz, who did a lot to add to the knowledge about Earth's natural history. He occupies a high place in the fields of natural sciences and environmental management. If you were like Dr. Agassiz, you were probably wondering where this lake named after this famous man is located in North America. It is not one whose location easily comes to mind. So let's find it on a map. Lake Agassiz is located on the edge of the northern Great Plains and runs from the tip of northeastern South Dakota north through Manitoba and covers land from Saskatchewan in the west to Ontario in the east. If you have any knowledge of North American geography, you are probably a bit confused right now. You are thinking, wait, there's no lake there. Sure, we have heard of Lake Superior and Lake Huron. Those are great lakes. We have even heard about Hudson Bay. But a lake bigger than all the Great Lakes combined, and maybe even as large as Hudson Bay? This has to be some kind of joke. This satellite image of Canada shows the landscape that we would expect. We can see the Great Lakes in Hudson Bay. As we expect, there's no big lake in the middle of Canada. So Lake Agassiz is a joke, right? Or maybe a figment of my imagination? Well, not exactly. Let's start this presentation over. I'm going to add one word to our title slide. Rather than just Lake Agassiz, I'm going to talk about Glacial Lake Agassiz which is a prehistoric but not ancient lake that has shaped much of North America and still influences the environment and region today and will long into the future. The term glacial lake is not one that rolls off the tongue, so let's start with some background on glacial lakes. The following information comes from the U.S. National Snow and Ice Data Center, which is a nice resource for understanding glaciers and their development. A glacial lake is one that originates from a glacier. As defined by the NSIDC, a glacial lake can form at the base of a glacier, but can also form on, in, or under glaciers. While we are looking at the prehistoric glacial lake Agassiz, we have glacial lakes that exist around the world today, although climate change is altering their formation and persistence. The weight of the ice and debris found within the glacier shapes the landscape by carving channels and holes in the underlying rock. As the ice from the glacier melts and the ice sheet retreats, the meltwater fills in these holes and gouges, creating glacial lakes. Glacial lakes can also be formed by dams that hold back the melting water. These ice walls form at choke points in valleys and fords, retaining a lot of water for many years. Depending upon the landscape and the size of the dam, these lakes can be massive. If we look at the location of Glacial Lake Agassiz, this is a relatively flat landscape that was bulldozed by the advancing and retreating glaciers. While the glacial dams that held back the glacial meltwater were probably not that high, they ran for long distances along the perimeter, holding back the meltwater. As with any other dam, glacial dams are subject to failure. Depending upon the amount of water they are holding back, the damage can be massive. Current glacial lake dam failure can wash away communities and damage infrastructure. Massive glacial dam failures like the one that happened with Lake Agassiz reshape the land, and they do it quickly. Glacial Lake Agassiz was formed by the advance and retreat of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. This is a massive ice sheet that covered much of the northern part of North America, and was about two and a half miles, or four kilometers, thick. The Laurentide Ice Sheet began advancing around 2.5 million years ago, and started its final retreat around 11,000 years ago. As this ice moved across the landscape, advancing and retreating, it carved much of the landscape that we know today, including the Great Lakes. The timeline for the retreat of the Laurentide Glacier aligns with people moving into and across North America, so it was likely that the earliest North Americans saw the ice sheet and the rise and collapse of Glacial Lake Agassiz. 
These early people were in for one heck of a show, as the ice dams collapsed and water angrily rushed across the landscape, wiping out everything in its path and reshaping the land, including those early people and their villages that happened to be in the way. The Laurentide ice sheet did not collapse all at once. Rather, it advanced and retreated, leaving behind glacial moraine dams and ice dams that influenced the way the lake drained. In addition, as the glacier was retreating to the north, it prevented the water from draining that way, which meant that water had to find other outlets. These timelines are close estimates of where the lake drained over the past 12,000 years. Let's look at each of these directional changes. The first and third drainage directions for Glacial Lake Agassiz was to the south, through Glacial River Warren. It's difficult to think about these glacial rivers on today's landscape, but Glacial River Warren carved the Minnesota River Valley before connecting with the Mississippi River and continuing south. This image shows the Minnesota River today. Today's Minnesota River is a generally placid body of water flowing within a deeply incised gorge that runs through western and southern Minnesota until it reaches the Mississippi River. Being only 10,000 years old, it would be natural to wonder how such a river could carve such a massive gorge in the landscape. Well, the Minnesota River did not carve that gorge. Rather, it was Glacial River Warren that did the brunt of the work to move the massive amount of earth downstream. This image shows the comparison between the river today in the heavy blue line compared with the volume of the River Warren. As you can see, there is a massive difference between the two quantities of water. Glacial River Warren was a massive body of water draining a massive lake. Even accounting for the hundreds of years of drainage, there was still a significant amount of water moving through the system. For another perspective on the sheer size of Glacial River Warren, this is a cross-section of the Minnesota River Valley. You can see the dainty little Minnesota River compared to the Mega River Warren. As you can imagine, anything in the way would be in a world of water. While Glacial River Warren was impressive, the eastern drainage of Glacial Lake Agassiz was so much larger. As an ice dam formed on the southern outlet, the lake found a new outlet to the east, through the Great Lakes region. The first of these outlets was probably pretty standard for the drainage of this lake. Definitely large, but nothing compared to the second outlet that formed. For that, let's hear from Dr. Anthony P. Buchner of Manitoba Culture, Heritage, and Recreation. The eastern outlet was blocked by a glacial advance, and the lake rose to its previous level. And then approximately 9,500 years ago, the flood happened. 3,000 cubic kilometers, that is kilometers of water, or seven times the value of Lake Erie, drained from the lake into the Superior Basin in just a few weeks. Let me say that again. 3,000 cubic kilometers of water, or seven times the volume of Lake Erie, drained in just a few weeks. To me, that is unimaginable. I simply cannot wrap my brain around those numbers. The scouring of the landscape must have been complete. I think the assessment of catastrophic might, in this case, even be understating the damage. I think cataclysmic might be more appropriate. The final outlet of Glacial Lake Agassiz was to the north, where it drained into Hudson Bay. And of course, being Glacial Lake Agassiz, it would not do this the way one would think. At least I would have thought the lake would breach one of the last remaining ice dams and flow over the remnant of the Laurentide ice sheet. But nope, that is not what scientists believe happened. Rather, the water from the lake eroded under the ice sheet, lifting it so that the lake drained under the ice layer. There must have been ice bridges over the massive amount of drainage that lasted ever so briefly, creating a beautiful picture, if there had only been cameras. And then, a little over 8,000 years ago, it was gone, leaving behind the current landscape of flat lake bottom. While Glacial Lake Agassiz has left us, there are still substantial influences of the lake beyond what was carved during the outlets. In the southern portion of the historic basin, we have the Red River of the North. 
This basin is composed of rich farmland that lays on top of several feet of lake bed sediment full of nutrients. This basin outlets into Lake Winnipeg before flowing into Hudson Bay. The Red River Basin, being defined by such a relatively recent glacial retreat and discharge from a massive lake basin, is incredibly flat with very minor elevation change. If we take two major cities, Fargo, which lies at 867 feet above sea level, and Winnipeg, which lies at 725 feet above sea level, and we do some basic math, we find that with the straight line distance between these two cities, we only lose 151 feet over that distance. That is less than one foot per mile of elevation change. While it may not look like it, this is a picture of a beach from Glacial Lake Agassiz. While the floor of the lake is composed of rich clay nutrient sediment, the area around Glacial Lake Agassiz is composed of beach-like sediment dominated by sand. While these areas are good for native prairie and forests, it is less productive for crops. As a point of trivia, I used to live about a mile and a half from one of these beach ridges. Even though I lived near the glacial beach, I was not quite able to get a premium for having beachfront property. I guess I was 8,000 years too late. Once you get north of Lake Winnipeg, there are many rivers that flow into Hudson Bay from smaller drainages arising from the Lake Agassiz Basin. This part of the basin is rich in wildlife, as it is an interface between freshwater, shore zone habitat, and the seawater in Hudson Bay. It may seem odd that I would talk about a lake that is no longer with us as one of the world's great lakes. However, Glacial Lake Agassiz is one of the world's great bodies of water because of the massive role it had in shaping the landscape of the north central region of the U.S. and Canada. Without this lake, our landscape would have looked significantly different. There probably would not have been a Red River of the North, and cities like Fargo and Winnipeg would not be what they are today. And what about cities like Walhalla and Gimli? What would the landscape look like today, and how would it influence those who lived in land in which there had not been a glacial lake Agassiz?